Uh, welcome back to Locomotive Systems Training. Uh, Bruce McConnell here. Um, it's in January. Uh, hopefully where you're at, the weather is being nice to you. It's sunny and bright here, and um, hopefully where you are, it's sunny and bright too. Anyway, FRI Locomotive Inspection, part one continued. This is LSTV-022. This is our 22nd video we put out for your benefit, and hope you're enjoying them. A lot more good stuff to come. Okay, let's talk about wheels. Ladies and gentlemen, the most important thing on any locomotive by far is the wheels. That is the most important loco lo co locomotive component ever. You can't, the wheels cannot be stressed enough. That is so vital. If something bad or something wrong happens during the wheels, guess what? You're going on the ground. P plain and simple. The wheels have to be maintained in a very, very succinct kind of way. We don't, want it, we don't want to get to these defects, which we're going to get to here in just a minute, because uh, they can really raise havoc. Remember what I said early on when we did these videos? Anything below the running board gets extra scrutiny because wheels, trucks, brakes, couplers, cutting levers, fuel tank, anything like that can have, have major negative implications if we have defects and that can lead to derailments or other problems. All right, so let's talk about wheels. The purpose of the wheels is to support the weight of the locomotive and propel the locomotive down the track. The wheel also provides a surface tread, which is this area right in here, needed for applying the brakes to the locomotive. And these are the FRA, FRA rules that deal with wheels. So without any further ado, let's take a look at them. Wheels, a wheel and a tire. Whoa, wait a minute. I know what a wheel is. I just showed you a picture of one. But what is a tire? And why would the FRA put a term like tire in our FRA rules and regulations? Well, you got to kind of go way back in time a little bit back, well, at least back in the 40s and 50s, it says 1940s, 1950s, maybe early 60s, steam locomotives did not have wheels. They actually had a wheel and a tire that was actually heated up and actually shrunk onto a wheel. Hence the term tire. So this pretty much... And I'm sure, I know I've seen, I've seen shows on the high-speed bullet trains overseas that some of them had wheels and tires. But the tire they're referring to here is on steam locomotives. So a wheel and a tire, so in case they come across them, may not have any of the following conditions. What is the difference between a wheel and a tire? Well, I just mentioned that. Defects, a single flat spot that is two and a half inches or more in length or two adjoining spots that are each two or more inches in length. Well, what's a flat spot? Well, a flat spot, like the name implies, it's flat, and it's an area on the tread. Okay? So, wait a minute. I can legally have a flat spot, and the tire or wheel will still be legal? Yep, sure can, providing, it again, it's, uh, it's not more than two and a half inches or more in length, or two adjoining, which means they overlap each other, that are two inches or more in length. A chipper gouge in the flange that is, that is more than one and a half inches in length, and one half inch in width. So that's a pretty good chunk of metal out of that flange. Remember, the flange is what keeps that wheel on the track. Number three is a broken rim. Okay, If the tread measured from the flange at the 0.5 eighths above the tread and is less than three and three quarter inches in width. And again, that's a pretty big chunk of wheel missing on that, on that rim. Okay, The cool part is, I don't know of any railroads out there that when they got to that point that they didn't give that wheel some immediate attention. But you can still legally run it, provided it's no, no larger than, measured to 0.58 above it, and the tread is not less than three and three quarter inches in width. A shelled out spot that is two and a half inches or more in length or two adjoining spots that are each two or more inches in length. Shelling come, comes occur as a result of where you can microheat that wheel up and pieces actually chunk out of the tread. Okay, That's called shelling, shelled out spot. So. Uh, uh, you, can have, you can have them, but they can't be any larger than two and a half or more, or two adjoining that are two inches in length. A seam running lengthwise that is within three and three quarter inches of the flan. That way, like if the wheel's here, the seam would run parallel to the to the actual uh, wheel itself. Okay, and and all it is is just like a uh, like a seam or a straight line or a groove in that portion of the of the uh, of the of the flange. Okay, uh, let's see. A flange worn to a 7 8 thickness or less, gauged at a 0.3 inch above the tread. A tread worn hollow, 5 16 or more on a locomotive and road service, or 3 8 of an inch or more on a locomotive used in switching service. 
And again, what happens is as that locomotive goes down the track, that tread area will actually get worn or worn hollow out. Normal reaction between a steel wheel and a steel rear. Something's going to give. The wheel will, 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 will take that hit. A flange height of one and a half inches or more measured from the tread to the top of the flange. Tires, remember, steam days, less than one and a half inches thick. Rims, okay, less than one inch thick on locomotive and road service and less than three quarters on locomotive and yard service. So a little more forgiving on locomotives that are used strictly in yard service. A cracker break in the flange, tread, rim, plate, or hub. Okay, we don't want any cracks anywhere in this wheel or tire. A loose wheel or tire, that is, <laughs> yeah, that's definitely uh, bad news if you have a loose wheel or tire. Fusion welding may not be used on tires or steel wheels of a locomotive. Expect with the repair of a flat spot or worn flanges on locomotives used exclusively in yard service. A wheel has been welded is a welded wheel for the life of the wheel. Again, you're out in the main line, you got a, you got a really bad worn spot well beyond the limit. They'll bring a welder out, they'll weld that up, grind it down to get that locomotive from where it's at, out in the middle of wherever, into a facility that has the ability to, to change that, that wheel set out. Okay? And if they do use that wheel in the future, you got to remember, a wheel that's been welded is a welded wheel for the life of the wheel. Okay? Um, I've never seen a welded wheel that they actually put back into service. That's not to say they couldn't. Okay, so a lot of things you got to be careful of when you look at wheels. A lot of things to look and spec for. Traction motors. The purpose of the traction motor provides a rotational force that's applied to the wheel set gear that makes the wheels either move forwards or backwards. Here's a, here's a wheel. Here's a wheel behind this gear case. You can't see which is this one over here on the right hand side. They're pressed on geez, with m massive amounts of weight, to tonnage. Uh, 70, 80, 90 tons is used to press these wheels onto the axle. Obviously, they got to be on there and they have to be on there tightly. Um, things we look for, uh, these are the FRA rules that we're going to talk about and we're going to go to the next slide. But before we, do, before we do that, again, all this is either an AC or DC large electric motor and on one end you have the commutator. If you're electricians, you know what I'm talking about there. And on the other end you have a pinion gear. Uh, it can be 12 to 12 T, 15 T. This depends on the gear ratio between that traction motor and that wheel set that determines the RPM of that wheel and also with the motor. Okay, so you have the small pinion gear on this end, wherever that gear case is, whether it be there or right here, which is the same shot. Uh, inside here is a bunch of gear lubricant uh, that that keeps the the uh, the pinion gear and the the, the the large gear. They call it the bull gear. Uh, we want to keep that well lubricated, otherwise they wear up pretty darn quick. Traction motor, as you see there's quite a few defects you need to look out for. Number one, looser missing factors. If you'll go back one slide for a second, I want to show you this. Right down here you can see there's some rather large bolts. Uh, these are what they call support bearing cap bolts. They're right here. And again, they're just great big bolts with flat washers on them. Uh, they get a lot of torque. You got to remember, these bolts literally hold the support bearing cap Around, wrap it around the axle, bolts it to the traction motor, that keeps that wheel set locked into place. If those bolts come loose or become missing, that is a majorly huge defect. So let's go back. And there's other bolts we'll talk about here as well. So loose missing fasteners, accumulations of oil and grease in the traction motor. Remember, we talked about that. Anytime we have accumulations of oil and grease, it can be a fire hazard. Or if it's not like on a running board, a slipping or tripping hazard. So the FRA will look at that and say, no, 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 They've got, that's got to be cleaned off of there. A torn rip, broken or missing air duct. Let's go back for a second. I don't know if we can see the air duct from here. Uh, no, it's, well, you can see a little portion of it right back there. It's kind of a, an accordion type bellows. And it, and it, and it goes, it's compressed and expanded, it compressed, expanded, based on traction motor, vertical movement up and down. Inside there is a, is a large but fairly soft spring. And all we want to do is to keep that air duct in contact between the traction motor and up here on the bottom of the locomotive frame. We don't want any holes, rips, tears, or big gouges, or if the spring is weak, which we'll talk about here in a minute. We don't want any air gaps. We want every bit of air that that traction motor blower sends down to that traction motor to go through that traction motor. If not, we're going to have heating problems with that traction motor. It'll run hot. <clears throat> traction motor leads that are oil soaked, frayed, have poor or no insulation, and bare wires that are not properly clamped. Uh, you see that, that becomes a defect big time. Traction motor, no suspension assembly, the spring pack, 
If it's oil soaked, which a lot of times they are, damage or has a bottom clearance larger than a quarter of an inch. Okay, so if you're underneath the traction motor and you're looking up at the where that great big lug is, then you want to make sure that that clearance between the bottom of that, we call it a spring back, but the proper name is a traction motor no suspension assembly. If there's more than a quarter of an inch gap there, then that you want to write that up because there's something going on wrong with the upper lug. Okay? Uh, traction motor, no suspension, assembly, spring pack, pin retainer, binder, damaged or missing. You got to remember, that whole bottom end of that traction motor is right next to the ballast and the rails and the frogs and the switches and everything else that's down there. They get all swirled up and tossed up. So there's a, that, that, that whole bottom assembly of that traction motor, no suspension assembly, is subject to a lot of vibration, a lot of pounding. So you always want to look at the bottom of that to make sure all those, those pins and the binder that hold that in place are in there, they're secure, and they're tight. Traction motor support bearing cap cracked. That's a huge defect. Okay, that cap is cracked. You're going to, number one, leak oil. Number two, you also run the risk of having that crack even go even further. Uh, traction motor axle dust cover damage. Let's go back and I'll show you that. First of all, here's the caps right here. Here's a part of the cap. Here's the traction motor support bearing cap. If they get cracked, holds that axle in place. You might want to look at that really, really careful. Uh, here's the leads that we talked about earlier. They need to be clean and dry and then properly clamped and then the boots that, uh, that hold them in place. Okay. The support mechanism has to be there and it has to be working properly. The axle dust guard is located. That's a sheet metal half round deal that actually fits in here and it protects the middle of the axle from dirt, water, rain, rocks, you name it, whatever. Whatever comes across that and hits that. That's the axle dust card. Can't be have any holes in it. It can't be loose. Can't be having any damage to it. Okay, uh, traction motor axle dust guard is damaged or missing. If we can go back again, I'll show you that. Um, it will be on the opposite side of the gear case. This is the gear case here, and this is the gear case here. The axle uh, dust guard will be located right here. And it's a great big rubber seal that has a great big hose clamp that fits in there. And what it's designed to do is designed to keep dirt, dust, uh, oil, and all that other stuff away from that bearing. Because if you didn't have that axle dust guard, oil and dirt would get in there and it would really uh, uh, destroy that, that brass bearing there for thrust. Okay? So you want to look for that. Okay? Uh, traction motor gear case is loose. Damage, leaking, lubricant, or is missing. Let's go back again to that. Let's take a look. That's this superstructure right here. It's a rather large, uh, there's a top and bottom portion to that gear case. Uh, and again, it's, it's pretty stout metal, as you can see here. But because of the location where it's at, uh, I've gone underneath this thing and looked in the bottom of these and found holes, you know, two, three inches in diameter, big cracks and big tears, big dents. Uh, it, it's amazing what gets thrown up into the bottom side of this uh, traction motor and gear case area right in here. So again, you want to make sure that they're, they're there, they're intact. The, either the huck bolts or the regular bolts that hold it together are tight and intact and not damaged. Uh, you also want to make sure that they, they're, they're, it does not leak a whole bunch of what they call it's gear case lubricant but they, and the name, the slang that they have it for in the railroad industry called crater compound. It must have about a, uh, uh, a weight of about two because they come in little baggies. You have to, have to squeeze them to fit them in there and make them work. So you don't want these, the lid you want to make sure it's in, intact and tight. There's this type, which is a spring-loaded cap. They also have the flip type that goes up, and it stays up, and then when you're done putting the, the crater compound bags in there, you just close it back down. Again, you don't want a bunch of one, but a, a gear case oil lubricant all over this because it makes a mess, and that becomes a defect. Okay, let's go back. Um, the traction motor that is bird nested, over speed of the armature, copper one is, is exiting the motor openings. If you've ever seen that, go back to that for a second, that is a, something really to see. You'll notice that right in here, there's a, here's an air, air exit, and they're located in different places of the traction motor. Allows that cooling air that goes through that bellows air duct to go through the traction motor and then exit out in different places. What will happen is, if this armature is oversped and centrifugal force takes over, and it will literally take the copper windings, that great big armature, and it'll sling them outwards. Obviously, that armature shot, the traction motor shot, and it will literally plug everybody's openings up with copper. That trim they use, when you see it, it's called bird nesting. It's the weirdest thing you've ever seen. 
well, I don't know if you've ever seen the weirdest thing, but one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in the world of locomotives, and as soon as you see copper windings coming out of there, guess what? That traction motor's toast. It's got to be replaced. Okay, let's go back. Uh, let's see. Traction motor shows signs of overheat condition, burnt or blistered paint. Let's go back to it. Anytime you look in here, you see burnt or blistered paint. That's a clear example that traction motor has been overheated. Now you need to go in and check the oil, make sure the oil hasn't been burnt. The oil level, the quality of the oil in the support bearings right here, here and here and here and here. You also need to make sure the leads aren't burnt also. You want to look anywhere and everywhere. So if there's burnt, then they can also make notation to that and they can go ahead and replace that. All right, so let's move on. Here we go, the truck purpose of the traction motor known suspension assembly. It provides support of the traction motor and the truck frame. Note this assembly is referred to in the field as a traction motor spring pack. Okay? Um, this guy is a spring pack right here. And as you can see, there's a really huge, big, great big lug that sits on top of that that actually compresses the spring back down. I actually have about an eighth of an inch gap right here as that whole weight of that entire traction motor assembly. I think weighs about four tons is sitting on that spring pack and all the spring pack is is a laminate of steel and rubber combined in that traction motor it's a cushioning device okay so if I'm going down the track this way the bottom lug will be actually pushing up on it if I'm going the opposite way the traction motor will have a tendency to go down and then it would it would counteract that rotational force of the traction motor okay so let's take a look at it. This is the FRA rule that deals with it. The defects. Loose or missing fasteners. Remember, oil or grease on the spring pack, that becomes a federal defect. Oil and grease will eat away at rubber. Okay? And here's another one. More than a quarter inch clearance between the bottom of the spring pack and the bottom of the traction motor lug. That means when you look down here, you can't see from right here, but if you're in the, in the pit and you're looking up, the maximum clearance on this bottom lug to the bottom side of that spring pack should be no more than a quarter inch. A lot of times you'll see me, I'll have like an inch and a quarter, inch and a half. And what that means is that you've lost that one inch wear plate up above here. And you can fix it in the field, but the traction motor has to be raised up or jacked up. And then a new one inch wear plate has to be installed and welded back in. So that's, that's what that means. And of course, any physical damage. Oh, by the way, remember we talked about bird nesting a minute ago? This whole area here is another opening. That whole thing, that whole opening would just be filled with uh, copper winding. Just bleh. So for what it says, every opening in every opening in that traction motor will have copper windings in it. Finds its way there. Physical damage. We'll go back for a second on that traction motor. Any physical damage to the traction motor, uh, to the spring pack, anything there, you got to look at it to make sure it's intact. And by the way, these are the bolts on the spring pack binder, if you will. They got to be checked because these great big pins are supported by this binder. If these pins drop out, that's a big big problem for that traction motor. All right, enough for traction motor. Retention tank. The purpose of the retention tank is to retain all liquids that accumulate in the governor sump on a held until they can properly dispose of at a maintenance facility. Okay? We're finally capturing all this, these liquids, fuel, lube oil, cooling water, whatever else winds up that's in that sump. Any liquid is designed to go into that sump and now goes down through these pipes here and is now retained. And that's a fairly good sized tank. I'm guessing probably 12, 15 inches wide. And literally one from one side of the fuel tank clear across to the other on, the, on one end. Uh, you notice it has a dial gauge here for, for level. And it also has an outlet with a drain. You hook a large, almost like a fire hose onto here. And you hook it up to some kind of a, a, a bulk tank and open the valve and it drains it all out. When it's all drained out, you close it off and off you go. So let's take a look at the defects. Looser missing fasteners. Again, especially what mounts this thing to that locomotive, you got to check those. If, you know, for cracks or loose fasteners. A liquid's leaking from the tank. If I got, if this ball valve is bad, or if I, I got a bad fitting here, or this gauge is leaking oil or water or all the above, then that would be reported. A defective drain valve. If the drain valve doesn't work properly or doesn't work at all, that'd be a defect. And of course, remember, any physical damage. You gotta remember, that locomotive's in the, pretty much the central, central location as a traction motor. A lot of dirt, a lot of dust, a lot of debris, a lot of, a lot of debris, excuse me, a lot of stuff in here that this uh, fuel tank, a retention tank, and fuel tank for that matter, gets subjected to. So we want to kind of give it a really good eyeball to make sure there's no defects in that. Okay? Next one. Okay, the main reservoir cutout cock. 
The purpose of the main reservoir cutout cock is either open, shown here, smallest arrow right here, above the handle lock, which allows air in the main reservoir to flow to the brake equipment, or to close, which will then close off the flow coming out of the main reservoir tank. Note, the handle position shown here is in the open position. There's a little lever, you can't see it very well, there's a little cast in line on top of this handle that lets you know that the valve is in the open position. When the handle is in line with the air pipe, the cutout cock is in the closed position. So when we take this, we squeeze this handle, the little spring right here, we squeeze that handle down and rotate it. Now that line, that casting line of the handle is now perpendicular to that. Now we have just closed off that valve. When in the closed position, the air will vent out of the bottom of the cutout cock at the elbow shown here, which is a small arrow right here. Now, a couple things you need to be aware of. Number one, and this is all about the cutout cock and everything in this area. Number one, we need to make sure that we get able to squeeze this handle and we let up on that handle that goes back down. Okay, you compress the spring, all allows us to open it and close it. When we let off on that handle, that handle should go back up, which would lock it either into the open position or the closed position. Okay, now if we go in the closed position and we start draining this air out of this line here for this tank or from this line here, what will happen is air will come out of that. Now it is an FRA defect when you, if that little elbow was facing out, facing you, and that air was hitting you in the face, that becomes a defect. That line, that little elbow, either has to be in or down. Wherever that valve is positioned, anywhere in that locomotive, the air cannot be blowing out at you. If you feel air blowing at you, that becomes an FRA defect. Okay? All right, so there's the rules. Let's take a look at the defects. Loose or missing fasteners. Loose, damaged, or missing handle and or handle nut. Remember, these things clang, bang around for a lot, a lot of time. Those nuts on top of the handle can get loose. They'll get loose and they'll spin right off. And next thing you know, you go there and the handle's missing or the nut's missing. Obviously a defect. Um, weak and broken or missing spring. Okay. Uh, handle does not lock not, or not work. Stuck in the open position. Uh, elbows loose, missing or facing outward, which we talked about a minute ago. Uh, air leaks, handle does not rotate freely, okay? Now, even though it's not listed here, what would happen if I had oil and grease on that handle? You're right, that would become an FRA defect. I've never seen oil and grease on that, but that's not to say it couldn't happen. But anyway, all right, so those are the defects we look at. Now, here's our FRA website, and it is www.fra.dot. Dot gov. So if you get a chance, see what we're looking at, what we're covering, then go over there and check out those rules and compare them and, and give us a call or send us an email. All right. With that being said, we want to hear from you. So give us a call or call us or send an email to the following web address. Ours is lst-ca.com. Once again, the, our web address is lst-ca.com. Anyone anyway, want to thank you again. Look forward to seeing you next week. We'll get into more of this stuff. And like I said, we're almost on part two, so bear with me. Thank you so much for, for supporting us and uh, have a great day.